Welcome to another episode of The Inquisitive Analyst. I'm your host, Marcus Udekang. It's a show where we chat about business analysis and project management issues and the challenges and triumphs within those fields. It's inspiring, informative, and very much inquisitive. Today, my guest is a certified project manager and consultant. She's led organizational and strategic projects and programs. And she's also worked with international project teams to launch new products. So please help me welcome to today's show, joining us all the way from Salt Lake City, Utah, Maite Mata. Welcome, Maite. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you for having me in your show. It's a pleasure to chat with you. Oh, you're very welcome. <laughs> now, I should ask you, like I ask all my guests, how did you get started in project management consulting? So my story is a little interesting because I got my master's degree in chemical engineering and I was doing my last week, the last test, and I got a call from IBM and they offered me an amazing job opportunity in the technology consulting field. So you can imagine I was kind of confused from chemical engineering to technology. However, I said, why not? It means I'm young, let's reinvent myself. I grow very fast. They trained me to be uh, one of the best business analysts in the company, but I was growing so fast. And one day I realized, that's not business analysis what I am doing. I'm a project manager. So I assume that you heard about this term, project management by accident. So that's what happened to me. So what I did is I need to learn more about this projects, things that I am managing and I am leading. I joined webinars, I read articles, and finally, I decide after the three years of mandatory experience to apply for my PMP certification and I start formally my journey in the consulting field. Nice. Now, just out of curiosity, how did you find the PMP exam? Tough in the beginning or not too tough? Not very, very challenging. I think that was more challenging for me was my first test that was in English. Mm. So although I was familiar with the terms, I was uh, kind of uh, scared about taking a four hour test in English, but it was okay. I passed properly, so Good. no big deal. Great, splendid. Now, what would you say are some of your lessons learned from working as an international project manager? Yeah, thanks to my job, I had the opportunity to travel and lead teams around the world. North America, Southeast Asia, China, Latin America, and Europe. Dealing with cultural differences, it's, it's key. And because your stakeholders, your colleagues, your peers, maybe you misunderstand your gestures, have different views towards time schedules, or express their emotions in a different way. So my first time maybe was 10 years ago. It was my first opportunity leading a project in France on site, that is not the same by phone. And after one week in my meetings, one I, I see that the people were looking at me and staring at me and I said, oops, that's something wrong here. So I challenged one of my trust people in the team and I said, what happened? What people stare at me like that? And they told me, why are you always upset? I said, upset. So I stopped the meetings, we, need, we went to grab a coffee, and after a small chat, I realized that my tone of the voice was very loud for them, that my hands movement, that you can see that I cannot stop, were excessive for them. That made the team think that I was upset with them, or they gather, I was gathering the requirements for the meetings in a very offensive manner for them. So that was my first painful experience that helped me to understand how critical it is to overcome cultural backgrounds when leading diverse and cross international teams. Yeah, I think that's so important. And there's so many things we sort of take for granted. Like you said, you're just doing actions that you don't realize might you know, mean something else to some other group. If you're talking too much with your hands, <laughs> versus that's if, you're, correct. if you're too serious, some culture <laughs> like that. Uh, fascinating. Yeah. Now, how do you think that volunteering uh, makes you a better program or project manager? Because I know you're heavily involved with volunteering. Yeah, I, I will explain a little why I'm doing 
during 20, what I did during 2021 and how it looks 2022. Nowadays, I'm volunteering at PMI. I'm making some sporadic contributions for PMI local chapter, like Northern Utah chapter, other is US or Latin America chapters. I'm highly engaged and collaborating in the site that they have, the projectmanagement.com. Related project and program manager, now I am also ambassador for the PMO leadership. And non-project or program related, I'm very, very passionate about TED, TED Talks and the TEDx environments. So I'm part of the organizing committee from the TEDx Salt Lake City event that we have here in Utah. And as I didn't have enough, I'm supporting a local organization that provides support and counseling to families, LGBTQ+, reviewing some English and Spanish uh, translation of the documentation. So that was 2021. 2022 looks very similar, fully engaged with volunteers. And why? Because I'm learning a lot. This opportunity that volunteers give me to experiment between pro about project management or program management. As a project program manager, I love planning and organizing, anticipating any risk and developing adequate responses. For me, effective problem solving before was following step by step, using a designate framework, and you will know it, a lot, a lot of Excel files. <laughs> but volunteering, I found that work can be unpredictable. Even in the best organized plans, for example, you are organizing a lunch outdoors and it starts raining, or the payment for the food don't arrive on time. You have a piano, who is going to move the piano? I am not strong enough. Or where is the speaker and performer's food? So the only choice that I have in those situations was to prioritize and find the most acceptable solution make a fast decision and find the team member that can support the activity. So I convert my volunteer experience into dramatic problem solving agility. I improve my tendency to favor action over inaction. So through volunteering, I learn and practice and assign tasks to other team members. I empower the team and all these kind of leadership skills Help me to smooth my career transaction after 14 years in technology to the operations and strategic side in the companies. So through volunteering, me and other people, this global community of volunteers around the world, we are a huge workforce. I think that we amplify our collaboration, active listening, communications, and for sure, leadership skills. Yeah, there's so much. I volunteer with Toastmasters. And I volunteer with PMI and I volunteer with IABA. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Now, um, just to get back on very quickly about cultural backgrounds. So how, how do you think, say, project managers can overcome cultural backgrounds when they're leading diverse teams? Is there any secret sauce that we need? Yeah, I need that we need, need to learn and create self-awareness about our culturally based perceptions norms or patterns of thinking and adapt our behaviors according to the specific cultural context that we are providing some service or we are working. After my first working experience in person outside of Spain, I, my main focus was to develop at least three areas that helped me to overcome. The first one was communication. As I told you, my voice tone was loud. My hands were moving so fast. So effective communications are key to don't get lost on translation. Also, nonverbal communications, moving the hands. Or, for example, in Spain, when you met someone, you gave a firm handshake. You do direct a contact or you kiss someone in the cheek. That will be so unusual or even offensive in other cultures. So... Learning communication for each culture, that's key. In the second place, workplace etiquette. So this is something that I learned. Punctuality is relative. And that can sound odd, but being from Spain, it's not a big deal if you arrive five to 10 minutes late to a meeting. However, my first meeting in Germany, I was late because they were expecting that I arrived 10 minutes early. Yeah. However, in United States or South Korea, you are expected to be on time, not later, not early. So this workplace etiquette is something that we need to learn before traveling or dealing with other cultures. Finally, 
it's less but not least important uh, organizational hierarchy. In some cultures, uh, you need to know that junior staff or middle management may be or may not be allowed to talk in the meetings. So if you are leading with the meetings and you see some people quiet, understand the cultural difference about the country that you are working. And if you need to challenge these people, maybe do it outside and not in front of their managers. So those are the three key takeaways and something that I was working hard since my first experience, communication, etiquette, and understanding the organizational hierarchy in each of the countries. I, I know exactly what you mean <laughs> when it comes to showing up early or showing up late. And uh, so many cultures are, are different about this. And it, it's yes. funny, it's funny the interactions you get when you come to a, a meeting late versus yeah. not, you know, 10 minutes earlier, five minutes before. That's now, true. actually talking about meetings and coming on time and, and most of us or many of us today are working from home. And apart from being able to get to a meeting early from home, uh, many of us have sort of fallen into an element of, say, boredom. How do you beat boredom when you're working at home? Any suggestions or recommendations? Yeah, I read about that because it was very exciting how the last year I'm still working from home. And I learned that this boredom feeling is called cabin fever. And it's representing different people in a different way. There are people that feel anxiety, others are liability, boredom, boredom, boredom or redlessness. So I, I was reading because some days I was like, I'm bored here at home. So I was trying to investigate how I can cope with that and uh, give my team members also support them in this kind of feeling to be all day at home. Very important is get some sun and vitamin D. Now it's snowing here in Utah, so I will not go outside. But in, during a spring or autumn, what I try to do is grab my computer and if I don't have very important meetings or it's only answering emails, I go to the backyard and a little of sunshine help me a lot. I need to be very strict with my boundaries. Something that I realize is by being at home when my phone sound or an email beep, beep it's like, oh, something important happened. I need to set boundaries that help me a lot. People, exercise, mindful, it's very, very helpful. We can improve our living and working space. Did you hear about Marie Kondo? So sometimes doing this, this decluttering thing in your shelf, it's helping a lot. And also for me, it's helping to try to change the scenery. Every two months, I change the position of my table. I have a home office now uh, before was facing the window. Now that is winter and I don't like too much. There's no, so I'm facing a wall and I have a nice <laughs> picture of the beach. So this change of a scenery and switching up my workplace can help prevent this cabin fever to, to get so quickly to, to you. Last, keeping eating patterns. How many times did you have lunch in front of your computer? Every and day. You're saying, every, <laughs> every day. day. So <laughs> stop, stop and try to have your 15 minutes lunch, maybe reading a book or looking outside or Try to catch up with a friend during this time. These kind of things is the ones that are helping me to keep all my energy for work and for my family and for my friends and be 100% for all the activities and volunteer activities, work activities, family activities that I am dealing in my chaotic life. That was funny. You know, sometimes if I'm working from home, I decide to take a 15-minute walk, maybe every two hours or something, just to get out and get refreshed, even in the wintertime. Yeah. So that's a good solution. Now, um, how you're if you're working online and you've got a number of teams you're working with online, how do you how do you better engage your teams while you're working from yeah. home? I'm the opinion that uh, working from home uh, is here to stay. Doesn't matter what happened in this pandemic, but uh, for example, in my case, I will decide that it's a good option for me. And one thing that we need to do is to stay connected and foster social interaction. One of the most complaints that I hear from friends and coworkers is that they feel lonely. So what I usually try to do is scheduling some coffee break and ask about how you are, what are your plans for the weekend? That also helped me to show interest and show that I care for my team, that I care for the people that work for me. 
both of these things staying connected and show them that I care is helping me to establish a truthful relationship and build trust with the team. So I know that there are a lot of remote activities and games and trivials, and I read and learned about it. However, <clears throat> I didn't have the chance to practice that because sometimes the people only want to express how they are feeling. How is your day? What are you doing this weekend? Do you have a soccer game with your kid? So I prefer during this last year, I was working in this, building this trust and relationship with the team. Wanted. I like that. Now, what do you think is your secret to ensuring that projects are successful? Is there any secret <laughs> sauce to this? One? There is no secret formula, Marcus. There is no. That will ensure to you that you deliver a perfect project on time, on budget, and the quality that is requested. It's not one plus one is two. However, there is something that I learned during my career. All is about the people, not the project. Trust your team. Ask for feedback, provide feedback, build a support network at work. Who can help you? Who, who deal with a similar project? And I saw work with forums, platforms, uh, sites like projectmanagement.com, the PMO. They will help you the things that you don't know to ensure that you can achieve as most successful project as you can with the tools that you have. That's splendid. Now, you did mention a bit earlier that you volunteer with the PMO leader. Uh, you're the America's ambassador for the PMO leader. What's that experience been like? Yes, I am. It's been amazing and a learning experience. I was excited to find a newly created community that has everything that you need to grow as a PMO leader. This is a community where people around the world share their knowledge, collaborate, experience. There are book clubs podcast, webinar, and guess what I love more? There are two things that I love. The first one is that there is no preference about methodologies or framework. We work together, we learn together, and we try to improve as much as we can. I was kind of bored about this uh, discussion and debate about waterfall, agile, hybrid. I really believe that this debate should stop. We need to focus on what is best for our business and for our teams. As I mentioned before, it's all about people. So, and another super important thing, it's free. So mm -hmm. all these resources, very handy with a monthly membership. What else you can ask for? So if you don't mind, Marcus, allow me, I would like to invite all the listeners to your show to join the membership. It's free and start building a real the, sorry. So, if Marcus, if you will allow me, I would like to invite all your audience and listeners today to become mem members and learn from these amazing ambassadors, community board members, how to become a real PMO leader and build amazing PMOs that serve your organizations. I was going to say that uh, I believe I'm an ambassador as well. So yes, you are. I, I definitely, definitely support that um, that call out to anyone out there who wants to be an ambassador for the PMO leader. Splendid. Now, Maite, just in closing, if anyone wants to, anyone from the audience wants to get in touch with you, how can they do so? Yeah, as you mentioned, I am active in projectmanagement.com, the PMO leader. However, I think that the best and fast way to find me is via LinkedIn. So they can reach me, they can connect with me, and I can. I am here to help whatever they need. Splendid. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show, Maite. Thank you very much. I know we've been talking back and forth about getting this interview going, and we finally got it done. So I want to thank you for your time, and I hope you have yourself a wonderful day in, um, in Utah. Thank you, Marcus. Take care. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. And now a word from our sponsors. The Lewis Institute provides an enterprise project management program that does more than just train PMs. It helps support them from the CEO level on down. These courses help certify project leaders and prepare them to pass the PMP exam.